Welcome to Cincinnati's History and Sound, um, a collaboration of the Cincinnati Chamber Orchestra and the Cincinnati Museum Center. Uh, my name is Eckhart Proy. I'm the music director of the Cincinnati Chamber Orchestra, and I'm joined here by our history expert and guide on our journey, Janice Forte. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you very much, and welcome to Cincinnati Museum Center at Union Terminal. We're thrilled to have you here because Music in Cincinnati has been a collaborative project since the day the first founders got off the flatboat. I'm sure there was a fiddle somewhere on that boat. But we're standing here in this wonderful exhibit hall that takes you back to Cincinnati in 1850. And if you can imagine being in this wonderful area with the riverboat, and the sound of music, and people laughing, and people crying, and people calling out to each other. But music was the binder to all of that. And here behind us again is our wonderful riverboat. And our riverboats, once they got established on the river after 1811, had calliopes. And those calliopes announced to the people in the cities that they were coming down the river. So music became the announcing card, the business card for so many people. And on this riverboat was everything from people who could not speak English. We had the Irish, we had the Italians, and the Germans coming to Cincinnati. Imagine living on this boat, coming from Pittsburgh, that boat ride would last sometimes four weeks depending on the level of the river. And you were crammed in there if you were, had passage on the lower deck. And on the upper deck were the staterooms. Why were they called staterooms? Because one of the first founders of riverboats on the Ohio River and the Mississippi called them staterooms after the states that were part of the Union at the time. So if you were assigned the Kentucky room, that was your state room. And those are the rooms up there that we see on the upper deck of our beautiful riverboat. And how hazardous was the trip up the river? Well, it was rather hazardous for the people who first came here. And our, the people who got off that first flat, flat boat in 1887, once the Northwest Territory was uh, developed in this area, they came to purchase land. And imagine coming down a flatboat in December uh, and it's cold and there was no real heating in the boat. And so you were crammed in with a couple people or sometimes a lot of people, but usually there was a fiddle player. There was somebody who played fiddle in most families. And so to keep the spirits up, they would fiddle. So we are uh, going to connect the history of Cincinnati and the river uh, with music of the time. And I want to introduce the musicians, um, two musicians of the Cincinnati Chamber Orchestra. We have our concertmaster, Celeste Goldenboyer, who's going to play the violin, and our cellist, Nat Chaitkin. And uh, our first piece uh, is going to be a waltz from Mexico, of all places, because Mexico is not usually the country you think of when you think of waltzes. Um, it was actually um, um, Austria that was the birthplace of the Viennese Waltz. It became hugely popular, so popular that it actually swept across the Atlantic to North America and Mexico. And that was this young street musician in Mexico that nobody had heard of. He was also a young composer, Juventino Rosas. And he composed his own waltz, which in turn became so popular that it swept back across the Atlantic and was almost mixed up with the famous waltzes of the time in Vienna. So it is very likely that his waltz was known to the people, to the immigrants arriving from Germany and from Europe here in Cincinnati. So the waltz is called Sopra las Olas or Over the Waves.
market. It's beautiful. There's so much beautiful produce and goods. It's definitely making me hungry. Would you tell me more about this market? Well, this market was a thriving place for Cincinnati because people who wanted to be farmers actually came here and tried to figure out how to be a farmer. We have to remember that there were a lot of immigrants coming to Cincinnati who really didn't know how to do farming, where to get a job, what to do, where to live. There were so many different aspects that these people had to deal with on a daily basis. Once they got off that riverboat, what were they going to do? But they knew that Cincinnati had opportunities for them. So let's just say you came to Cincinnati to find work as a seamstress. What do you do? You get off that boat and you start talking to people probably find the nearest female and ask her. There were so many seamstresses in Cincinnati, for example, there were over 2,000 cottage industries just for a single woman in her house to sew. And then you have the tradesmen in the beer industry and the wine industry, let's not forget about that, uh, here in Cincinnati. So there was always a job to be found, but you've You've got to place yourself and find a place to live. And if you had children, if you had a wife, where are you going to go? You had to start asking questions pretty quickly. And there were boarding room houses. There were uh, taverns, the tops of taverns that could be rented out. Uh, many people slept right on the riverfront because they had no other place to go. But you can imagine that was not a good place to be because of all the activity of animals coming and going and the barrels of whiskey and the bales of wheat and hay coming and going off the riverboats. So you needed to move on to the first street, the second street, and the third street. One of the things that's interesting is Cincinnati from the very beginning had charities set up for single women who came to Cincinnati uh, they had uh, places for men to stay, and you can count on they were mostly religious organizations. And one was the Union Bethel. Today, that area of town that we know is Lytle Park, that was the area where Union Bethel kind of started their idea of taking care of, of all people, drunken sailors that came right off the riverboat. It was a hard life. Many times you were paid in liquor. And so that is, was your way of life. Well, thank you for telling us all about that. Now we'll play a What Shall We Do with the Drunken Sailor. <laughs> Enjoy.
record. What does that sign say? So this is in a beer halle, uh, which is mean it's a hall for beer, where you go inside. There's another German tradition, which is the beer garden, which is outside. And uh, beer has been around in Germany for over 2,000 years, so there's plenty of it. We have a lot of experience with it. So uh, let's, and by the way, down here it says Gutes Essen und Gemütlichkeit, which means good food and coziness or comfort. So you're, so you're supposed to feel at home in there, and we will. So let's go inside. So, willkommen, wir sind in der Bierhalle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Well, this is so typical of Cincinnati, and we have easily over a hundred uh, saloons. And there's a difference between a saloon, a tavern, a beer garden. And so, uh, if you were a German immigrant, you had to have your beer. It's very important to you to uh, socialize with your beer, and you would actually, in many ways, if you were going to a beer hall, you would actually bring your children. And there's actually a very famous beer hall in Munich, the Hofbräuhaus. And I actually went there with my little, little baby, and they don't care, you know, the stroller just goes somewhere. And there's a lot of these, these long, long tables, and everybody's there and, and sings. And there's an oompa band, of course. They play all day long, and you can, you can be there as long as you want to. Did they sing? They, oh, yeah. Oh, More or less. I don't know if you can call it singing, per se, but they try, for sure. <laughs> yeah. But it was in here that uh, the Germans taught so much to the city of Cincinnati. Uh, our banking system is based on much like the banking system in Germany, uh, right down to the newspapers. But the singing probably was the most important. And there's been a resurgence now of all things uh, breweries in Cincinnati. So hopefully you'll get a chance to go taste some. Oh, uh, oh I have, I have. And actually, when I first came, uh, when I first came to Cincinnati, I was amazed because a lot of these old churches still have the, like, about in 1800, blah, 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 so erected in 1800, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and so I was like, well, this is a German town. And, okay. then, and then I did not know, so I came here, so I, I, I saw this area called Over the Rhine, and I was like, how did that happen? How did it happen? <laughs> well, Cincinnati had the Miami Erie Canal, which was a route from uh, Toledo, Ohio, that came down to Cincinnati. And it was really the, one of the fastest ways to get people from Northern Ohio, coming out of even New York, to get to Cincinnati was by canal boat. And it was a canal. And so that canal came through what we know today is I Interstate 75, came down to the heart of Cincinnati, right by the back of our music hall, and then intersected off to the east side. And so when the Germans came over from Germany in the 1840s, that canal was there, and it was very viable. And the place where they went when they got off the boats uh, was to go north of the canal, because that's the only place where they had room to grow and to build their houses. And so there were so many German people. There were 30% 30, 30 of the population in Cincinnati was German. And so they kind of just eased their way in. And it is said in many newspapers from that time that if you crossed the canal, it was like going into Germany. Everybody was speaking German. Uh, you could get your best sausages over there, best beer. And so it was the newspapers who actually started calling it, are you going over the Rhine? Which was like saying, are you going over the canal to go to, into over the Rhine? And to this day, that saying has stuck. Over the Rhine. And whenever I go there and, <laughs> and, I, and I wander the neighborhood, I kind of, I kind of, I can see that. I can, I can, I can see the history, and I kind of feel a little bit at home as well. Oh, that makes us feel yeah. very, very good. And and of course, um, beer and being social is kind of you know, and and also making music, as you said, was something that was was done. Now, not so much anymore. I mean, beer gardens or uh, beer halls don't have music anymore. Um, but we're actually going to play music that was likely played in a beer hall like this, or maybe even in beer gardens. And we have uh, we have two pieces. One is by Johann Strauss. 
It is a polka, and it's actually a jockey polka. So um, our cellist, and Nat, uh, instead of playing the cello, actually plays a whip, uh, imitating the whipping of the horse by the, by the, by the jockey. It's a, it's a joke, it's a joke. Um, and then a piece that every German and Austrian um, child knows. It's called Ach du lieber Augustin. Oh dear Augustin. And Augustin um, was a man in the 17th century who went to a beer hall, um, drank a little bit too much, and then fell asleep in the streets. And that was the time of the plague. So the grave diggers roamed the streets and just picked up everybody that looked dead. And he looked dead. And so they picked him up and threw him into a big grave together with all the other victims of the blood plague. Now, when Augustine woke up, he could not climb out because the grave was too deep. Fortunately, he had his bagpipe, and so he started playing the bagpipe. <laughs> uh, and then people found him because of that. So, so that's where the song Ach du lieber Augustin, or Oh dear Augustin, comes from. So we have two pieces, the Jockey Polka by Strauss and Ach du lieber Augustin. That's right.
Janice, with Ohio, with the Ohio River being the line between slavery and freedom, what was it like for newly liberated African Americans in Cincinnati? That's a really great question because there were so many people coming out of the Deep South and Kentucky that Cincinnati became almost the funnel to the Underground Railroad. But what we have to remember is during the 1850s in Cincinnati is that we did have freed black people living and thriving in Cincinnati. Cincinnati was a, not a microcosm, is there a word, like macrocosm of everyone who wanted to be somebody was in Cincinnati during the 1850s. And so those people that were freed slaves came to Cincinnati. You know, I, I sometimes think maybe they didn't want to be too far from their families that were still enslaved in the South. And so they came to Cincinnati to learn a trade or to bring their trade with them. And so we are standing in front of the Ball and Thomas Photography Studio. And this was so well known because of their excellent work, the way they photographed all sorts of people, daguerreotype, in daguerreotype, that um, James Presley Ball was actually asked to photograph uh, Queen Victoria, Ulysses S. Grant, because of his quality of work. He traveled around, he became very well known that he could travel to other cities and do his work. And then we also had um, Henry Boyd here, whose shop was famous for his beds. The Henry Boyd bed was shipped out of Cincinnati to all over the United States. And one thing about Henry Boyd is that he employed both black and white people because of the quality of bed that he had. And it's actually written that Henry Boyd, during the um, cholera epidemics, had his, his family and his employees boil water. And because of that, his employees survived. Back then, that was the most serious epidemic in any city at that time. Our next piece, The Maple Leaf Rag, is another African-American success story. Published in 1899, this tune put both its composer, Scott Joplin, and ragtime music in general on the map. Joplin was raised in Arkansas, and at the time he wrote this tune, was living in Missouri and teaching piano. He later moved to New York City, wrote a couple operas, and many more rags, but this is by far the most successful piece he ever had, and uh, the royalties from the sheet music helped support him for the rest of his life. Thank you. 
Janice. Hi. Would you tell me about these trunks? That looks like there's so many interesting items in them. Well, there are, and can you imagine traveling today for weeks at a time carrying one of these trunks? Not me. But these are the trunks that would have been brought all the way from Europe, whether or not it's Germany, Ireland, Italy, England. And those are the people that it would have uh, purchased a ticket to come to Cincinnati to make their way in the world. Cincinnati was the fastest growing city in the United States in the 1850s. And what you see in these trunks are some of the things they would have brought. They couldn't bring everything. So many people left their families and they left their favorite things back home. But these are the things they would have needed. This is a dressmaker's trunk. And you can see she has brought her favorite needles. She has brought a note from a friend wishing her luck here in Cincinnati. Then here you have, someone must have had some money. And she brought her china and a menorah and some lamps are in the trunk. And this is just what we see on top. You wonder what their heart brought with them that's underneath all of this. And again, when they were traveling, they were just, it wasn't one person. It was entire families that came here to make a new life in the grand city of Cincinnati. And this is one of my favorites. This is a tool chest. And so many people were encouraged to come to Cincinnati who had a trade, especially those German immigrants who were looking for a new life. Well, thank you for sharing that, Janice. That's so interesting. You know, when I think about songs that we sing when we feel like we're homesick or maybe missing family, I think about the song Auld Lang Syne, which is a song that was uh, a, a Scottish air. Uh, and the words mean, for the sake of old times. So we'll play that now. So, um, Janice, Cincinnati grew rapidly, uh, eventually becoming, I think, the sixth largest city in the U.S. Um, what role did music play, in particular in early Cincinnati? Well, Cincinnati has always wanted to be, uh, I'm going to use the term, queen city of music. It's what people get, how they got their heart was through the music. If you can imagine all of these immigrants coming into Cincinnati, and we also have freed enslaved people that have come. And they come to Cincinnati and what's the common denominator? It's music. It's music where I will bring my banjo, I will bring my fiddle, and I'll bring my spoons. And it's the thing that brought it to life and still holds dear to all of us. And what's amazing is Stephen Foster, who's just an amazing person, came to Cincinnati. His father said, Stephen, you have to get a job. So he comes to Cincinnati to work with his brother. 
and his brother is a bookkeeper. And his heart is really in music. He knows the music, the real music of America is within the people. You have to go and talk to them. You need to listen to the cadence of their voice. You need to get their hearts. And so he wanders the streets of Cincinnati and he starts to write his music. And so, but his heart is in the music because he got to know the people. And so uh, his life is not good. His wife leaves him because he's dedicated to the music and he dies a pauper. But the great gift is that we still have his music. So um, this actually marks the end of our first video exploring the history, the music history of uh, Cincinnati. And I want to thank you, um, uh, Janice, uh, for being our historical guide. I want to thank our musicians. And I want to thank you for watching and inviting you for our second video when we uh, go to the Union Terminal and explore transportation to Cincinnati, in Cincinnati, and from Cincinnati. <laughs> uh, we do all of it. Uh, but for now, uh, we want to wrap up with a very famous song by Stephen Foster, Angeline the Baker. Thank you.